This is Duke University. Global trade and environmental Being justice. Human rights China issues today. are still. The term Ubuntu. A alien and sedition accident. He's making inferential discoveries. The importance of an archive. The John Ho Franklin Center. If you walked into many African American households on January the 1st, New Year's Eve, you likely smelled collard greens, black eyed peas, cornbread, and perhaps chitlins. That's a smell that would stay with you for a long time afterwards. We call that soul food. And Byron Hurt will be on Left of Black today discussing his new film, Soul Food Junkies. And later we're joined by Professor Blair L. M. Kelly, professor of history at North Carolina State University to talk about her new book, A Right to Ride, which describes the struggles against discrimination on public transportation in the United States at the beginning of the 20th century. I'm Mark Anthony Neal and this is Left of Black. You're watching Left of Black, Happy New Year. I'm Mark Anthony Neal, and we're here this afternoon with a special guest, Mr. Byron Hurt. How are you doing, Byron? I'm doing great, brother. How are you doing? Happy New Year. Happy New Year to you, too. Uh, you, of course, are probably most well-known to, to our audience for your fabulous film, Hip Hop Beyond Beats and Rhymes. Uh, can, can you talk a little bit about what it's been like these last few years? Um, traveling to different audiences with the film, getting responses to the film. Uh, I, I mean, for those of you who haven't seen the film, it, it's a film that really takes on this issue of masculinity within hip hop, you know, both as black men and, and men in general relate to each other, but also obviously in terms of how they relate to women. Uh, well, Mark, I can just say it's, it's been incredible, you know, for me these last uh, several years since I made Hip Hop Beyond Beats and Rhymes, uh, since the film premiered at Sundance, um, you know, I've had the opportunity, obviously, to have the film uh, air nationally on PBS uh, a couple of times uh, and travel with the film extensively around the country and, you know, various parts of the world. And it's just been phenomenal for me and phenomenal um, to be a part of an experience where people are engaging in the ideas that the film addresses, um, you know, who, who are challenged by, you know, what the film is presenting you know, the themes that I cover around masculinity and misogyny and homophobia and homoeroticism, um, it's been tremendous for me. Uh, I feel really blessed and fortunate that I had the opportunity to kind of um, be one of the creative uh, forces with that film, as well as Sabrina Gordon, who was my associate producer, and Stanley Nelson, who was my executive producer, um, and also the Ford Foundation and ITVS, who made it happen from right, a money right. perspective. Right. I, I just read a, a, a really interesting, fabulous interview, really, with uh, the novelist Adam Mansbach, uh, interviewed the, the rapper Farrell Monch. And in, in the course of the interview, you know, Adam asked Farrell if he had seen his film, had seen your film, you know, Beyond Beats and Rhymes. Did he really? And, yeah. Okay. <laughs> and, and, and I wonder for you, what has the response been to, to the film, you know, from whatever rappers, artists you may have come in contact with, you know, both those who are in the film, but also those who weren't in the film, but may have had a chance to see, see different clips of it. Yeah. I think one of the most memorable uh, moments for me personally, you know, as the film's creator and as a hip hop fan was uh, one day I was um, at a, a juice bar in um, the Lower East Side, you know, um, in Manhattan. And... I walked in this juice bar that I always go into, and some guy just bumps me. He just bumps me real hard, you know, as I'm walking in the door. And I look up, and it's Q-Tip <laughs> from Five Call Quest. And, you know, I think that, you know, I thought that he just hit me accidentally, but he, you know, he reached his hand out, you know, he gave me a real strong, firm pound, you know. And he said, yo, man, he was like, I saw your film on PBS, man. He was like, yo, that's my joint right there. You know, and I was just like, I, I was so, I, I felt like a 16-year-old boy, you know, at that moment, you know, because, you know, Tribe Called Quest, you know, that's a, a good part of my of my youth as a, a, a you know, late teenager. Classic early. material. Yeah. So, I mean, that was, one of, that was one of my favorite moments. But, I mean, I've got a lot of um, really great feedback from a lot of different people, some not so great feedback. Right. I didn't get the, the kind of negative responses from the indus industry that I thought that I might get. Um, most people who saw the film, Mark, honestly, you know, really um, celebrated for the most part. I mean, it, people do bear their critique on it. It's not a perfect film, but 
overall, I would have to say that, um, you know, people really responded to it very well. I think, um, you know, Chuck D, you know, who was in the film, was a very strong advocate of it. Talib Kweli has yeah. been very supportive. Um, M1 from Dead Prez, you know, I've been on a few different panel discussions with him, you know, talking about the film. Um, I didn't really get a whole lot of feedback from people like Fat Joe, who was in the film, or um, Jada Kiss, who I interviewed. But um, for, for most people who, who saw it, they really appreciated it. I didn't, I didn't really get any negative pushback. Yeah. Do you, only, do only, you, only, I have to, I do, I will say <laughs> that I did get into a minor confrontation with um, uh, oh, like Stephen Hill. Stephen Hill. Oh, of course, uh, right. <laughs> Um, who was not very um, appreciative of how he was framed in the film. Well, I mean, he helped to frame himself that way. <laughs> I'll just leave it at that. But that, that, was, that was probably, you know, the, the most confrontation that I, I sort of um, had to deal with. You know, uh, Do you think that it's helped change the conversation? Um, I know when everything I read about gender and hip hop and masculinity, I mean, one of the first reference points is, is always your film. Mm -hmm. So clearly I think activists and scholars and, and teachers, those who are in the classroom, you know, see the relevance of it, obviously. But, but, but do you think it's actually changed the conversation around gender and sexuality within hip hop, or at least helped to change the conversation? Well, I think you make a real good point that, you know, within the world of academia and the world of activism and people who are concerned and who think about um, the issues that I focus on. Right, particularly the, among and, young people, right. Yeah. Um, I, I think that it has. I think it's had a, an impact on those who have viewed it. I still get emails every single day from people who say that they've seen the film for the very first time in a classroom somewhere yeah, or yeah. at a workshop or at a conference, and they email me and they thank me. And this, this is from people from all over the world, not just here in the United States. You know, I get at least an email a day from people who have seen it. So I think that's a testament to the, the power of the film and the impact of the film. Has it has it had an impact on the industry? I would say no. I mean, I, mean, I would say that, you know, um, not much has really changed. I just think that the, the artists maybe have changed. Um, the visual treatment of maybe some music videos has changed a little bit, but I don't think overall. I just got an email sent to me just a few minutes ago about the latest controversy around Kanye West's, West's new video. Monster video, yeah. Uh, yeah, the monster video. I mean, I haven't seen the video, but apparently there are some uh, images and representations of, of, of women who are be, or who are hanging from a tree. I haven't seen it, so I can't really speak about it, but I think the, the issues are, are pervasive. But I think that just goes to show just how, how deeply embedded patriarchy and sexism and misogyny and hyper-masculinity are within yeah. American culture. Yeah. You know, it's going to take education on multiple levels. You know, the work that you're doing, um, you know, in the, in the world of academia, the work that activists like Kevin Powell and Quentin Walcott and Ted Bunch are doing, yeah, 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 you know, yeah, yeah. you know, working with men, I think is is really critical. And there are a whole lot of other men that I can't I, that I know of, but I won't name right now. But, you know, the, the work is being done. But I just think that it's just a really hard sort of nut to crack, you know, and I just think that it's just going to take a lot of education. You're watching Left to Black. Happy New Year's. This is Mark Anthony Neal, and we're here with the filmmaker Byron Hurt, director of the film Hip Hop Beyond Beats and Rhymes. Uh, Byron, you're working on a new film now, uh, yes. Soul Food Junkies. Um, talk a little bit about the film, and, and really talk about the transition yeah. from the world of hip hop to you know to the world of African American cuisine and, and really African American health. Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, it, this film Soul Food Junkies that I'm working on right now is. It's a departure from the, the normal subject matter that I usually address, and that is gender or, or race and gender. Black masculinity, yeah. Black masculinity. Um, and, and it comes from a real personal place. Um, you know, I, I sort of got the idea of, of making this film when my father was diagnosed mm -hmm. with pancreatic cancer, which you, mm -hmm. you, I'm sure you remember. Yeah. You yeah. were very supportive of me during that time, you know, when I was going through. And, and I remember specifically you talking about his eating habits. I, I remember. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. And so, so you know, one of the things that was a, that had always been a challenge for me, Mark, was my relationship with my, my father and his eating habits and his particularly his weight. And I was always very concerned that I was going to lose my father at an early age because of his obesity and that that might lead to a heart attack or a stroke or something of that nature. I, I would have never imagined that um, I would lose my father to pancreatic cancer. But when he was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer, um, you know, I started doing some research and I started to to learn um, how pancreatic cancer dis disproportionately affects African-American men. Mm -hmm. And one of the contributing factors, not the only factor, but one of the contributing factors to pancreatic cancer is obesity yeah. um, and a high fat 
red meat diet, which my father had, and some other factors that I think may have contributed to it. I can't prove that, but that was one of the, the things that really stuck out to me, struck, struck me as I did research. And so while my father was sick, um, you know, we, we always tried to get him to change his eating habits, and he did make an attempt to change his eating habits, but it was very, very difficult for him to do that. It was a real challenge. And I just started thinking about us as black people and our relationship to food, um, our culinary tradition, you know, how soul food is such a huge part of our cultural identity, but it may not always be the healthiest food that yeah. to eat. Um, Especially with all also, that salt. <laughs> with all that salt, you know, and I'm not trying, I'm not condemning, the film is not going to condemn soul food. It's both a celebration and a critique, much yeah. like, you know, hip hop yeah. beyond beats and rhymes was. And then there are all kinds of other things that we have to deal with, you know, in terms of our, our health and our eating habits, like fast food, processed food, yeah. the food industry. And, you know, another issue or another, um, Thing that I like to focus on with the film is is the emerging um, food justice movement. You know that's really yeah. um, sort of burgeoning and taking place around the country. And there's so many young activists and older activists who have been involved in food justice um, activism for a long time. You know, trying to educate people about um, how to get better quality access to food. Excuse me, how to get better access to quality food. Um, challenging the food industry, educating people. You know about you know, the importance of eating good quality food. So, I mean, my film hopefully will be very uh, layered and textured um, and will be both a celebration of our culinary tradition, but also a critique, um, you know, in a way that's going to, you know, get us to sort of think more critically about what we put into our bodies. You're a documentary filmmaker, and, you know, that, that means different things for different people. Um, let me talk about it from specifically the funding standpoint. I mean, you, you see someone like Chris Rock do a film like Good Hair, and it can open to hundreds of theaters and get wide release and folks are conversating about it. But, you know, you're part of a cadre of, of African-American documentary filmmakers who, who really just have been doing it on the grind. Yeah. Um, and, and so what is the difficulty of, of the one hand trying to maintain your creative vision around making a food like Soul Food Junkies? And, and, and thankfully, you had the, part, the partnerships of IVTS and, and the Ford Foundation for Beyond Beats and Rhymes. But what's the challenges of trying to maintain your creative vision for the film, your educational vision for the film, and at the same time having to do the business piece of it to try to raise funding, you know, mm. to get the film done? You see all these gray hairs on my chin, <laughs> <laughs> on, on my, the side of my face. Um, well, you know, it's, it's, I have to say that I've been very fortunate. You know, as an independent filmmaker, I've been fortunate to receive funding from ITVS and the Ford Foundation and, um, and other funders who have uh, supported my work and a lot of other filmmakers, particularly black filmmakers, and even more so, I would have to say, women of color filmmakers who are yeah. independent filmmakers um, don't have the same kind of um, support that I do. So I, I have, I'm very grateful for that, but I also understand that um, it's a challenge for filmmakers of color to get their films made, and I know a lot of uh, a lot of filmmakers um, who have great ideas, have great stories to tell, but they just can't get their films made because they just don't have the support. So I, I understand and I recognize that um, because of Hip Hop Beyond Beats and Rhymes, and maybe even a little bit before Hip Hop Beyond Beats and Rhymes, you know, I, I was kind of like a golden child, or, and I'm still kind of a golden child in terms of receiving funding, you know, for my films, and I, I understand that. But it is difficult, you know, especially when you're dealing with uh, social issue documentaries like I Am um, and other filmmakers are, you know, trying to create. There's not a lot of resources out there. So when you get resources like I do, you kind of have to hit yeah. it out of the park. You know, yeah. you kind of have to make sure that you... Um, show and prove that you are capable, that you, you, that you can handle the management of a project, you know, that, that gets funding. Um, and the way that I look at it, and this is something that I tell, you know, my staff and I try to emphasize to my staff is that, you know, as, as filmmakers of color, we have an opportunity here to kind of pave the way for other filmmakers of color. You know, we have to show that we can do a lot with, with very little resources. And so I don't just think about myself when I'm making the film. I'm thinking about filmmakers who are coming behind me, just as filmmakers like Stanley Nelson and Orlando Bagwell um, and St. Clair Bourne and Kathy Sandler and, and other filmmakers have done, you know, for, for my generation of filmmakers. So I think the, the way that we um, put ourselves in a position to get money to make our films is to make great films and to tell great stories. Yeah. 
You're watching Left of Black. I'm Mark Anthony Neal. We're here with Byron Hurt, director most recently of Hip Hop Beyond Beats and Rhymes and currently working on a new film, Soul Food Junkies. Uh, Byron, I remember a few years ago, actually going back about 15 years ago when I was still doing radio, uh, I, I did an interview with Madison Davis Lacey. Um, he had just done this incredible film on, on PBS on Richard Wright. Um, and in order for him to finish that film, he actually had to work with Ken Burns uh, mm -hmm. on one of his projects. Wow. And, and I remember asking um, Davis, you know, what are the kind of films that he wanted to make in the future? And I mean, he literally rattled off about 12 or 11 films. I mean, things that he knew he would never get the chance to do because he would mm -hmm. never get the kind of funding. Um, right. You're still relatively early in your career. I mean, you're a young man still. I mean, what are the kind of things you want to tackle going forward? Well, I have a list myself. You know, I got about 17 films I want to make. <laughs> you know what I mean? But, you know, I got to tell you, man, it's, it's difficult to make documentary films. I mean, it's difficult to make them and make them well. You know, yeah. it's difficult to, if you want to really take the time to really get underneath a story or an issue, it's, it's hard to make them and make them well. So I, I appreciate filmmakers like my mentor and executive producer, Stanley Nelson, you know, who makes like a documentary a year. You know, I, I have to give him a lot of props for his hustle, you know, for his hustle and for his ability to be prolific as a filmmaker. Um, you know, I, I'm, I'm working with a, a group of people um, uh, on a, a project, a film project that has not been funded yet, but I'd like to tack you, tackle some of the issues around um, whiteness and white privilege in American mm -hmm. culture. Um, I, I do want to continue to make films about um, race, class, and gender, particularly, um, particularly issues that affect um, us as men and masculinity and gender violence and sexual violence. I think those are really, really important issues that still need a lot of um, education around. And I think yeah. film is a great way to do that. So I have I have a list of films. You know, I, I wish that I had the kind of deal that someone like Ken Burns has where he had <laughs> like a 10 or $15 million deal to create, you know, 10 documentaries. I mean, I love making documentary films, man. I'm, I'm passionate about it. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of weird in that way. I'm like a doc. Geek. You know what I'm saying? I, I can, I can watch a documentary film a day, you know, and, and, and really, um, absorb the documentary and, 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 and deconstruct it and, and figure out how it's been put together and stuff like that. I just love it. So I just, I hope that I'm blessed, you know, to continue to do what I do. You've been watching Left to Black. I'm Mark Anthony Neal. We've been joined this afternoon with film director, documentary film director Byron Hurt, uh, most recently of Hip Hop Beyond Beats and Rhymes and currently working on Soul Food Junkies. Uh, we can follow you, Byron, on Twitter at Byron Hurt, simply. Absolutely, yeah, absolutely. Byron Hurt. I'm also on Facebook, facebook.com slash Byron Hurt. Um, I also have a Soul Food Junkies page on Facebook, just Soul Food Jun I mean, uh, Facebook slash Soul Food Junkies. And um, also, you can find information on my website, www.behurt.com. Thanks for joining us, Byron. Hope to have you on again when the film is done. Much love to you, Mark. You too. Appreciate it. All right. Take care. Take care. Uh, yeah, my mom, she uh, fixed all the, all the black eyed peas and collard greens for good luck for the New Year's. It's kind of like a tradition, a family tradition. Uh, yeah, I read about this South American custom about eating 12 grapes at midnight, one for every month, and then an extra one for good luck. I'm gonna have some black eyed peas and some collard greens and some chicken. Yeah, it was good. We're back here on Left of Black. I'm Mark Anthony Neal, and we are joined by another special guest, Professor Blair L.M. Kelly historian in North Carolina State University and of course a Duke University grad. I am. Welcome back. Thanks for having How me. How are you doing? We're Happy talking uh, about your new book, okay. Right to Ride, Streetcar Boycotts, Amer African American Citizenship in the Era of Plessy versus Ferguson. Mm -hmm. um, how's the book going to receive so far? Um, really well. I mean, it's a surreal and amazing thing to write a book for so long and you know and be alone. Have it out in the world, yeah, right? you're so alone with it and you feel a little crazy. So to have people reading it and citing it and working on some of the ideas yeah. that I uh, tap into is it's been amazing. When we talk about race and segregation in American society, right? Everybody knows Plessy, right? Yes. Plessy versus Ferguson. Well, Ferguson. they think they do. Right. And then the story always jumps to mm -hmm. Brown mm -hmm. 
and Montgomery. And, and, and the beauty of your book is that it, it fills in all of these flanks in between. When I first heard about the book, I immediately thought about Robin Kelly's work, his essay, Contested Terrain, yes. you know, yes. where he's talking about Birmingham in the 1940s. And, and you go back even further. Right? Yes. I mean, you begin the book talking about a story from 1854. Yes. <laughs> um, yes. You know, where there's this challenge to this idea of segregation in, in public transportation. But the bulk of the book is really at the beginning of the 20th century. I mean, mm -hmm. how did you get interested in this particular subject? Matter? Well, I think that gap you talk about is what I was interested in thinking about. Um, as an undergrad, you go to write mm -hmm. um, uh, class projects. I wrote my senior thesis. Um, with Reginald Butler, on, um, thinking about voting rights and Lonnie Grenier, okay. and um, I just ran into a blank space, and I was like, "Well, what? What is? The, <laughs> you know, can you tell me where I should go?" And he was like, "You need to. You need to know what's there. Yeah. You need to yeah. research what's yeah. there." And I was like, "Okay." As an undergrad, didn't begin to know how to do it, um, but it's always been an interest of mine um, as mm -hmm. I was going through graduate school. And then I ran into that article by um, August Meyer and Elliot Rudwick. Mm -hmm covering mm -hmm. the streetcar boycott movement, mm -hmm. um, which they compared to the Montgomery bus boycott movement of the 1950s, but said it was lacking, it was conservative, and it failed. Mm -hmm. And so it's not really that important. But it, it changed what I was thinking about the time period. I was like, well, there was this movement in 25 different southern cities. Why isn't it documented? Why, yeah. isn't, why aren't we going back and looking more yeah. closely at this, at this moment that's supposed to be the time of Booker T. Washington? And it's not. It's a, a time of, of different kinds of yeah. things going on. So I really wanted to sort of go back and look once again at that particular moment and figure out the degree to which dissent is always present, right? right. We have this way of sort of saying the, the generation of the 1950s is this awakening. Yeah. Um, the Eyes on the Prize series begins with a, a right. one called Awakenings, as if all yeah. African Americans were asleep, as opposed to frustrated yeah. and, and um, unable to move the cause forward in the years before. So uh, I think by reframing this as an ongoing struggle, that, that fails ultimately yeah. in this earlier time period and yet succeeds in a, a later one is a better way to I'm understand that civil rights struggle. You focus on three cities. Um, in some ways, Richmond makes sense. I mean, we think about Richmond as mm -hmm. part of a Southern history of black struggle. Yes. Less so places like Savannah. Mm -hmm. um, and definitely New Orleans rarely comes, you know, yes. into play. Yes, it's confusing. Um, <laughs> and, and, and so why those particular cities? Well, I mean, I love thinking about New Orleans um, for myriad reasons. I teach a course on the history of New Orleans vis-a-vis -vis the Katrina yeah. disaster. Um, and, and, you know, Plessy takes place there. Yeah. And so it forces us, um, uh, Albion Tourge, who was the attorney, was interested in the, the, the folks in New Orleans because he's mm -hmm. like, oh, these uh, light-skinned Creoles of color, they confound what we know <laughs> what about, we race. about race. Yeah. And so he, he tried <laughs> to use that in his argument before the court. And so I think I'm attracted for the same mm -hmm. uh, reasons, is that they, they really complicate this project of segregating America, yeah. um, they remind us that race is this um, multi-layered kind of experience. And you have this group that's in between initially and is trying to wedge a space for themselves um, and, and it's, they're failing to do so as, as segregation clamps down. And then, it, and then also to think about African Americans who are not descended from the Creoles of color in New Orleans, who usually are sort of wholly ignored in terms of the struggle there. And so I wanted to, to create this really amazing community where you have different um, African Americans who can yeah. think about their history differently, who think about who they are differently, um, and approach politics differently. You talk about some of the class dynamics, mm -hmm. um, the way that, you know, given so many few options, you know, to target people who are, are the cause of your affliction, right? It was very easy for some middle class blacks yes. to target the behavior yes. of, of poor and working class blacks in public spaces on public transportation yes. and as being the root cause, right? And it's still such an uh, argument uh, yeah, that we keep know. having yeah. over yeah. and yeah. over right. and over. You know, the Bill Cosby <laughs> conundrum, right. basically saying it's the fault of the poor. If they could just behave correctly, right. then we could all rise up together and yeah. it'd be really great. Um, and so I love the fact that um, Maggie Lena Walker was countering that notion mm -hmm. um, as part of the heart and the center of her women's movement um, that Elsa Barkley Brown begins to right. unearth for us. And then I try to add a bit with this story of um, the streetcar boycotts. But to know that um, she's seeing the world and saying, no, lynching and segregation are to attack 
all of us, yeah. and particularly the best of us, particularly those who are challenging uh, the rule of whites in the South at this time. And so she's saying there isn't someone to blame here within our community. This is coming from, from the outside. outside. And we could behave perfectly <laughs> every day. And we'd still be, and we would still be yeah. we would face it even more. Yeah. You're watching Left of Black, I'm Mark Anthony Neal. We're here with Professor Blair Ellen Kelly, Professor of History at North Carolina State University, author of the new book, Right to Ride, Streetcar Boycotts and African American Citizenship in the Era of Plessy versus Ferguson. If you had published this book 10 years ago, um, promoting it would be different. Um, it'd be a more traditional moment you tried to be on NPR. <laughs> um, I mean, you try all these other different kinds of ways, some more successful than others. Always I still a challenge. Love NPR. I think it's beautiful. Uh, <laughs> always a challenge, though, for black writers in general of nonfiction and black academics. Yes. Um, but this book gets published May of this year, May of 2010, mm -hmm. and, and Twitter exists. Mm -hmm. um, how has Twitter enhanced, helped, or even presented a challenge to you know getting the work out there? You know, to the widest readership possible? I mean, I, I come to Twitter in a really strange way. I mean, I basically um, got on as a challenge to one of my friends who was tweeting earlier than mm -hmm. I was. And I was like, this is weird. And I, I kept trying to talk to her about, you know, something I saw in the paper. She's like, oh, we already talked about that on Twitter. And I'm like, what are you doing? You're wasting your time. <laughs> so I logged on and joined to just show her that it was a waste. And, and, and 5,000 followers later. And 5,000 <laughs> followers later, I'm, I'm like pro Twitter. I love it. And, and I, I think I came to it not as a, a strategic move mm -hmm. in terms of my career. I didn't get on Twitter saying, aha, I will promote my book. Yeah. You know, so I was yeah. on well before the book came out. I tweeted about, you know, writing the index and yeah, yeah. You know, all these things that people were asking me about it. Um, but I love the fact that there is a community of um, people who are interested in similar things. It's like having the most amazing cocktail party ever with the best guests. Um, you can access people who are not necessarily part of your uh, community, uh, artists and writers that I wouldn't normally be able to meet. Um, and then everyday people who really like history or have questions or yeah. are interested in it. And I, so I love the sort of democra uh, the m democracy that yeah, exists on Twitter yeah, yeah. and our ability to just engage in conversation with one another and, and to make contact um, uh, with, with regular folks who may not have known about our, our work in the first place. So, I mean, it was a risk. And then, you know, in academia, it was yeah. sort of... Uh, made fun of when I first said right. I'm on Twitter. Yeah, yeah, it's still a lot of folks making fun <laughs> yeah, of us. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> I, I told someone in my department that I tweeted her project and she looked at me with horror, like I had done something <laughs> bad to it. But um, I, I think it's a really um, amazing way mm -hmm. to just um, engage in a broader conversation. And it really redefines the work that we do as public intellectuals. Very much I, mean, so. I, I think, and, and a challenge to try to do that in 140 characters. Yes, yeah, yeah. Uh, know, but it's a, that's a great discipline. I love, <laughs> you know, writing it too long and then having to trim and figure out what's essential here. Right. So right. for me, it's really great practice, it's uh, being succinct. I, I want to talk about something else in the book that, that really struck me. Um, very often in these kind of huge potted histories of African American struggle, mm -hmm. um, you know, gender takes on a particular frame. It, it's always about great black men. Mm. And, and then, of course, we get the kind of honorary great white woman, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, um, you know, in the case of someone like Rosa Parks. Um, but when we go back and think about, you know, Montgomery, I mean, what continues the Montgomery boycott is this willingness of these black domestics, these black mm -hmm. women, mm -hmm. to walk the streets, right? Mm -hmm. If mm -hmm. at any point they had decided that they didn't want to do it anymore, the boycott would have ended. Mm -hmm. and, and I think of earlier work, um, Tara Hunter work, her, Hunter's yeah. work on black domestics in the 20th century, another, yeah. you know, Duke University graduate. Um, Duke University professor Vivoli Glimpse, right? Her yes. book, Out of Bondage. Um, yes. You talk about specifically the the dynamics of black domestics around these streetcars. Women who can sit up front yes. <laughs> with the little white kids yes. and the elderly white folks that they're yes. watching, but yes. you know, working, right? Yes. So they're given a certain amount of civil rights as a laborer, mm -hmm. <laughs> but mm -hmm. when they're no longer laborers and just simply citizens, right? Mm -hmm. Those rights are taken from them. Yes, right? yes. So it, it's, I mean, when I discovered those sort of loopholes in the law that were sort of saying, 
um, it's okay for you mm. to be here. Um, and, and to even think about the labor of black men on the, the mm. trains, you know, that they are the Pullman porters, that they are in all of these spaces. They inhabit every space. There's no exclusively all white space because there's always black uh, domestic uh, assistance in yeah. all those spaces. Yeah. Um, and yet those same people couldn't um, take their own children on a trip. In, in those same cars. And so it just reminds us that segregation isn't about physical distance right. between the races. It really is about enforcing inferiority. And white privilege, right? I mean, yes. those are, it, it's really about the privilege of that white kid that you're with and the privilege of that white elderly yes. person that you're with yes. more than anything. It's really amazing. We're on Left of Black. I'm Mark Anthony Neal. We're joined by Professor Blair Ellen Kelly, Professor of History at North Carolina State University, author of the new book, Right to Ride. One of the reasons why you're one of my favorite historians is that you follow and talk about and critique popular culture. I love it. Contemporary popular, yeah. you know, so whether that we're talking about Jay's Decoded um, mm -hmm. or some other Tyler Perry film that's out there <laughs> in the world, yeah. uh, and then of course our man, uh, you know, Barack, yes. <laughs> you know, yes. within that context. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I think you've carved out a very unique space because many historians don't find value Mm. And doing that, and, and, and perhaps it's generational, right? You yes, know. I think so. Well, I'm a, I mean, I'm a student of Wanima Lubiano, right? <laughs> that, so that does it, right? I, I have to understand the way. <laughs> Shout in out which to Wanima. <laughs> <laughs> I have to understand the way the, the way in which um, those things inform history and yeah. vice versa, yeah. and, and how to read particular contemporary moments for what they tell us yeah. about the residue of history. Right. I mean, so and it's great when I teach, right? So that I can say to my students. Let's think about Jim Crow as a performer. Who is he? He's a traveling <laughs> intruder. Um, he's barging into unexpected spaces. And then I can say, have you ever seen Flavor of Love? Right. What does he do <laughs> on that show? And then they freak out. They're like, right. wow. And right. they're like, do you think he's read Jim Crow? Do you think? And I'm like, I don't know. But I, I know that it resides with us. It's yeah. what we think is entertaining and yeah. what we think is funny. And, and the residue of, of, of these earliest minstrel performances are all over things right. without right. us even knowing. Right. So we have to understand both the history and the contemporary moment yeah. to really see that back and forth. We had Byron Hurd on earlier. Um, we talked a little bit about obviously his work around hip hop, beyond mm -hmm. beats and rhymes, hip hop mm -hmm. and gender. Um, and in some ways you can't have that conversation today at this moment without referencing uh, Kanye West in the general context. Yes. Um, but for specifically his new video for the song Monster. Yes. Um, and, you know, I, I've only seen it once. Um, Me too. You know, many folks who've seen it once and said they can't watch it again. Yeah. Um, there is a lot of, lot of chatter, um, just in general in the, in the journalistic world and, of course, on Twitter, mm -hmm. about the almost hyper misogyny, yes. misogyny uh, of, of the video. Yeah. Um, and, and not that we're anybody, you know, anybody is Kanye psychiatrist or therapist. Um, mm -hmm. and, I mean, what do you think is at the root? I honestly will say I don't know. I mean, I find the monster video to be incredibly disappointing. Mm. Um, I consider myself to be part of the hip hop community um, and, and reared and raised in mm. um, loving hip hop as, as sort of like yeah. the first thing that was my own as I came into adulthood. So it's really psychically upsetting to sort of turn on the video of a song that I thought was okay. And I have a CD of, of, of Kanye's, which I thought was really, you know, had some really great songs on it. And, and people are saying really positive things. And his choice in that moment is to string women up by chains yeah. and have them dangling dead yeah. in um, his video. It's, it's not, um, to me at all, aesthetically pleasing. It's yeah. an assault on women. And, and given that we know women are so frequently assaulted, it is- In just that way, right? In right. just that particular kind of way, um, or the Craigslist killer. And yeah, you know, yeah. It, it's not um, imaginary space. And so he has the yeah. zombie sort of figures in in the video, and, and one could argue this is sort of a shout out to Walking Dead or, or mm. some of those new sort of zombie genre things. But to just use these bodies to dismember women's bodies for for sport, mm -hmm. um, it is it, really jarring. And yeah. it and it, I mean, for a person like Kanye, who is smart. And right. who does and know so I much? I mean, not even just bookish. I mean, he's bookish. Yeah, right? he's bookish. <laughs> I mean, he's, he's a smart uh, <laughs> musician. He's yeah. a smart composer. He, he's a smart producer. And so, for him to do something that is such an assault yeah. on uh, women 
I think is really devastating to me. Yeah. So I'm just sort of, today I'm just disappointed with it. Maybe later I could give you a better <laughs> <laughs> critique. Uh, you've had the chance to read Decoded. I know you've tweeted yes. a great deal about that. Um, you know, how do you read Jay-Z growing up in public? Uh, I mean, I mean that's, and, and you can argue that's one of the most difficult things, right? You know, yeah. growing up is difficult enough, but to be able to grow up in public well, and it's amazing has, because yeah. I've grown toward Jay. Like I couldn't stand Jay. That makes two of us, right? When yeah. he first came out, um, and I sort of, you know, heard smart things for the first time in Blueprint, yeah. um, and really sort of been working with him that's, ever since. That's kind of my trajectory, also. Yeah. Um, and uh, you know, I think hip hop is uh, what it is, right? It's entertainment, and people do what they need to do to sell records and yeah. gain attention and. And what he was doing, I found to be, you know, extreme misogyny in the very beginning, yeah. and, and we're moving to somewhere um, more mature over time. And so Decoded, um, I think the, the act of writing as Jay-Z rather than Sean Carter yeah. was such an interesting choice um, to sort of uh, give us an inside look into uh, character building yeah. in hip hop, yeah. um, and to remind us that Brand it is, making. It yeah. is performance, yeah. right? Um, and it's not just sort of life story told, you know, plain. Mm -hmm. It is this sort of imaginary um, that, that he can reside in. I, I thought was really phenomenal. I, I know he worked with Dream Hampton, yeah. who was a... Um, uh, who'll be on next week, by the way. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, she's, uh, to me, one of the m foremost writers yeah. on hip hop. And yeah. so I know um, together they could really have a great conversation and form a great conversation for us to think about yeah. um, the, the insides of lyrics and the insides of this, this sort of character. You creation. know, there's something that, you know, one of the things that's been most amazing about the book going out into the world is, is the way that it's been marketed, right? Mm -hmm. So the public conversation with Cornell West, and, 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 and mm -hmm. I would argue, you know, that I, I, I want to ask whether that Cornell has listened to. <laughs> A lot of Jay Z <laughs> stuff. I, I, I could name about 15 of us that would have lined up very quickly who listened to Jay five times a day that would yeah. have loved to have been able to be in that position, but, yeah. but we love Cornell. Yeah. Um, the conversation with Charlie Rose, um, yeah. again, which is, yeah. is pretty extraordinary, and then listening to him on Dyson's show. And the embrace to him of with, Oprah. Right, which he is so right. You know, he is the lead episode of Oprah's Masterclass. Right? Yeah, again, yeah. Talking she, she gave away Decoded as her favorite thing. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> and but I, I want to compare that to a, a comment that the novelist Adam Manzabach made a, mm. a few days ago on Twitter that, you know, when you look at the access that Jay Z has given to folks, uh -huh. that part of that might be the fact that he's not expecting to get to really hard and difficult questions from the folks that he's made himself accessible to. That might be very true. I think there are, are folks who could um, flesh out a bit more with him. I, I, I was interested in his sort of choice of songs. Yeah, right. Um, <laughs> to, to analyze both for good and for bad. Mm -hmm. um, so some of my most, I think it, the book starts out with some of my most favorite yeah. uh, songs being analyzed. Uh, but there, were, there was more I wanted to see. Mm -hmm. I wanted him to think about the, the, uh, the role of beef, right? Yeah, with, right. With, and so he avoids this he completely. He avoids that all together, right. Um, and so there were, there were lots of moments where he really could have been challenged mm -hmm. about the kinds of image production, um, given that we know he knows better. Yeah, right. <laughs> and, and, and going back to Monster, um, him standing in front of a corpse of a woman in this video where the, the lyrics don't have anything to, to do, do with, with that, right. um, to me was like, You've already you've done decoded now. We know well, you know right. better. You know better than that, right? And so uh, you know, I think it, it's up to us to make and, sure. And would expect that you know better enough to then also pull Kanye aside. Exactly. Well, I don't know what that looks like. I don't know right. what their right. relationship is. <laughs> no, I got you. Right. But um, to, to choose not to do it. Yeah. And, and to choose to right. do something different or, or to stand out. Yeah. Um, uh, out of the way and let Kanye be Kanye and, and, and choose to <laughs> not participate in something like that. So when I know he sees women as whole and human and right. having voices in society, to, to choose to do that is, is weird. Yeah, a little troubling perhaps. Yes. You've been watching Left to Black. I'm Mark Anthony Neal. We've been here with Blair Ellen Kelly, professor of history at North Carolina State University, Duke University graduate. Thanks for joining us, Blair. It's great being here. I Thanks hope to so have much. you back soon. Anytime.
produced by Duke University, online at duke.edu.